Hello, and uh, welcome. This here is a video where I'm going to explain uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and introduce what I call a Maslow good, which is supposed to be a building block for a uh, moral ethical theory. So if you're not familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs and, and how it works, I'm just going to explain briefly essentially what this whole thing is. This here is a theory in psychology. Essentially, you have these five different levels in this pyramid, and every single level corresponds to different kinds of human motivations. Uh, for instance, at the bottom, you have physiological uh, motivations, or physiological needs, rather. You know, breathing, food, water, sleep, uh, homeostasis, etc. These are needs that uh, are physiologically required for people to survive. Then you have safety needs, love and belonging needs, esteem needs, self-actualization. It's it's a, a hierarchy of human needs. Uh, that's actually what it's called. <laughs> so, the a few things to note about this thing: the pyramid. Yeah, I mean, the reason it's a pyramid is the idea is the needs that are higher up on the pyramid are generally things that people want uh, less. Well, I, well, not not less, but people generally prioritize needs lower on the pyramid uh, above needs higher on the pyramid. For instance, every single human being virtually would, would uh, prioritize breathing over anything else on the list, right? So it's just in, in general. Uh, there are obviously exceptions to this, but I mean, uh, most people prioritize things down here above things up here. Now, that's one thing to note. Another thing to note is this theory is not uh, provable. This is not something that Maslow actually proved or uh, discovered. This is something that, this is a conjecture, essentially. This is just uh, informal uh, observation and and studying psychology he uh, wrote a paper and and he decided um, people tend to prioritize uh, their motivations and their needs in this fashion and he grouped different desires uh, in the levels specifically to that fashion now the reason there are five levels is the levels are actually distinct the they refer to instincts the, the the every single need like every single one of these levels has infinitely many needs for instance uh like you can go into infinite specificity about actual particular things that people want and desire like it, there's food here but like what kind of food there's tons of different kinds of food right but the the whole point the reason food is in the same level as breathing and water and all that stuff is because they all they're all physiological needs they are all unified in that they are motivated by a single solitary human instinct and the same thing with safety needs love and belonging needs etc the one thing i don't really know about this is why morality shows up up here and down here i i don't uh, i think i used to know that but i don't actually know that now and that's not that important i'm just gonna pretend morality is up here for uh during the video and the only other thing and this is a like a criticism that people have had towards maslow is why sex is down in the physiological level rather than the love and belonging uh, i think sex would definitely be up here in fact you have sexual intimacy here which is different than sex i suppose but it's not I mean, I'd consider sex to be on uh, third level. People definitely prioritize food. Like, like people prioritize these things way above sex. Uh, and even this stuff. Uh, so it's not unreasonable to assume it's higher up on the hierarchy. Now, uh, again, just to reiterate, this hierarchy is not exact. This does not refer to all people. There are obviously circumstantial and uh, exceptions where people prioritize things up here, above things down here. Like for instance, there's people who, there's martyrs who will die for their moral beliefs, uh, thus giving up their food, water, and et cetera, uh, but because they believe in God or something, uh, uh, they die for their beliefs. You know, there's, there's stuff like that. There's people uh, who, prioritize things up here. There are exceptions, but generally most people are prioritize things 
um, in the way that the pyramid describes. Another thing to note is that every single one of these levels is vast. There are literally tons of different, uh, like infinitely many uh, particular objects of desire belong to every single level. So uh, the, the levels are enormous and how much you value these individual objects of desire can vary, like within a given level, uh, can vary itself. For instance, do you prioritize family over friendship? I think most people probably would, or family above sexual intimacy. So there's levels within the levels. They're nested levels. And uh, in fact, within a given level, it's more like a continuous spectrum of, of, uh, uh, of needs. But the, the, the reason there's five distinct levels, and this is where the continuity ends, is, is because the instinct that drives these different motivations is different, which is why it's, you know, it's physiological here and it's a safety one here. Again, this isn't provable, but it's generally how things work. And it's not, uh, it, it's accuracy isn't uh, our concern, philosophically our concern. The, the, the whole point of, of Maslow isn't to say, this is how things work all the time. The point of it is to just is to be able to categorize human desires in a very elegant, easy to work with way. And, and that's exactly what this does. And it, and it does this accurately enough. It groups everything into five categories. That's all you need. So that's how Maslow works. Uh, now I'm going to introduce what I call a Maslow good or a Maslow resource. So uh, a resource though I defined it a few videos ago, but a resource, you can define it as something that, or I define it as something that a, uh, it is an object, so it's, it's an object of desire. It is an object that a human being, it is an object that would satisfy, that can be used to satisfy a human need. So it could be used to satisfy one of the needs on the pyramid. So, you know, if you have breathing as your need, then the object of desire would be air or oxygen. If food is your need, your the, the object of desire is food. So food is the resource. Now, I'm going to introduce some just basic terminology here, but since there's five levels, you can uh, classify objects of desire, uh, resources, you know, five different ways. So, you know, there's the physiological resources, safety resources, uh, love and belonging resources, esteem resources, self-actualization resources, uh, or you can just say level one, two, three, four, and five. Level five being the highest, level one being the lowest. And uh, I'm going to use the word good uh, interchangeably with resource during this explanation, just because good is easier to say than resource. So uh, let's think of examples, like what I'm going to do is I'm just going to think of examples of level one resources. There's not much point to this other than to just explain how this, uh, what these uh, different level resources are. So different level one resources, obviously food is a level one resources, water is a level one resource, um, sex, uh, we're pretending this isn't down here that it's on level three. So sleep would be a level one resource. So this is interesting. Sleep is not a material thing, right? So it's not actually a good. What it is, is uh, it's, but but the object of desire would be for you to do a certain thing with your own body, namely to lie down uh, in, a, in a bed or in somewhere and to close your eyes and to uh, basically postpone functionality for a given time, usually at night. So the object of des desire is for you to have the uh, time and opportunity to do that with your own body. So sleep is, the desire itself is to sleep, the object of desire is your own body being in a certain position and being in a certain physiological state. A state that you can postpone at will, but a state you uh, that uh, requires certain conditions in order for you to be able to enter. Uh, homeostasis is more of a scientific term. It, it, I, God, I don't know enough biology. I think this refers to like the the body's uh, how uh, the, the human body tries to keep everything balanced, like the temperature 
uh, and your body balance. You sweat to cool yourself. Uh, your body sweats to cool itself down. It, it uh, you get goosebumps to heat yourself up and uh, contraction, expansion. We're not going to get into that, but uh, it's it's a similar thing like sleep. It's a physiological need and the object of desires for your body to do certain things. Usually, this is not something that you uh, even get to control. Your body does this on its own. There's functions in the brain that do this for you. So. Uh, but, but mostly we're talking about food, air, water, and uh, food, air, and water. These these are the main three level one goods. And you could call them level one goods because these things can actually be traded in a marketplace. You can buy food and you can buy water. You don't really need to buy air unless it's, you know, polluted or there's a deficiency of air somehow. But most people, you know, can breathe. But uh, food is something you can buy. So if someone is buying uh, so someone is uh, growing uh, crops then they are growing a level one good uh, because it satisfies level one of uh, of Maslow uh, so right off the bat you can start to ask the question well okay the the food itself is a level one good what about technology that facilitates food production well since that indirectly affects food production and its main use it's its primary motivation and why it's made is to help satisfy level one physiological needs that would imply that uh, irrigation technology for instance is also a level one good uh, it also means that a farmer a farmer's service is a level one good uh, unless you want to grow the food yourself if you want someone to grow the food for you and to deliver it to a supermarket where you can get it that is all all of the services that are involved in that process are level one goods themselves because they're um, or they're level one goods for the person buying the food at least uh, because they are required in order for you to be able to get the food easily now same thing with water now a little bit of this kind of bleeds in bleeds into level two because uh, level two, I mean, it's he says safety, but I would also term this like comfort or or uh, ease of uh, doing things, being able to sort of live comfortably, being able, you know, not having to exert yourself. Obviously, growing your own food is problematic. Having someone else grow it for you makes it a lot easier. So a someone being a farmer would be sort of both a level one and level two good. And what that does is it introduces. Uh, another concept which I call a multi-level good a good that satisfies multiple level multiple levels of Maslow now if you think about it almost every single good is actually a multi-level good because almost every single thing satisfies at least several levels uh, on Maslow especially if you take into account causality you know for instance you know you need to eat food in order to be able, you know, in order to not feel hungry so that you can stay alive, so that you can continue having sex with your girlfriend. Well, you know, the, the, if, if that's your reason for staying alive, then eating food is also a level three good, technically, because it it facilitates, you know, the having sex, the, the, the sexual intimacy you have with your partner, which is a uh, level three need. So if you introduce causality, then... Uh, suddenly everything becomes a multi-level good now that makes things really complicated but you don't really need to worry because what you can do is you can just you can just focus on the direct use of the good and you can focus on you can imagine it like uh, the, the, a percentage of the good is you know it satisfies uh, the physi a physiological need, a, another percentage satisfies a safety need, another percentage satisfies a level three need, level four, level five, etc. Uh, so, you know, an apple could be like 50% level one good or 50% level two good. I mean, this is just a hypothetical example, right? So everything is partially a, uh, a, a level one good, or most things in, in life are partially a level one good because most things are done just to perpetuate your own life uh, longer. So everything, multi-level goods, multi-level good just means that it's, it is partially the need that the good satisfies, the needs that the good satisfies are on every level, and whichever need it satisfies the most, you know, that is the need, or you can, to, 
for, for us to say it satisfies one need more than others, it is primarily used to satisfy one need over others, we call it, uh, you know, uh, we call it a level something good where the level corresponds to the need it satisfies most. So if it's an apple, it's basically a level one good, even if it, you do have some other motivation for having an apple if you take causality into account, like I just explained. So, right. Uh, that's just like, again, the multi-level good thing is just a way for us to approximate uh, which level a good belongs to, to make things easier. And a pro this approximation is generally... Uh, it's it's generally accurate because it's hard for us to causally predict what our goods contribute to in the future. So security of body, safety. So what's a level two good? Um, a house would be a level two good. Shelter would be a level two good. Uh, a car would probably be a level two good. An umbrella would be a level two good. A uh, personal health would be a level two good. It says the family here as well. That's weird. Uh, employment, you know, general uh, having of resources so that you can feel secure about continuing to live. These are all level two goods. Um, so some kind of capital, uh, various assets. Basically, most things that you can actually buy and trade in today's economy are level one and two goods. Uh, in fact, almost all are level one and two goods. There's very little that's actually above. So, yeah, that, that's that's pretty much all you need to keep in mind. It, it, if something seems more like a level two good than a level one good, then it probably is. You know, if we look at like farmers, like I said earlier, to the farmer, being a farmer is a level one good and a level two good. Uh, to them, it's at least a level, it has to at least be partially level two because of course, to them, it's employment. Uh, but it's also level one because, you know, they need employment to get resources, to get food, to continue to live. So there's that. And to other people, someone being a farmer somewhere else is obviously a level one good because it facilitates the having of food and it makes things more comfortable. So to them, it's also a level two good. So let's go above and talk about level three, friendship, family, and sexual intimacy. Um, so right off the bat, you have very little of this can actually be traded in a market. Uh, let's start with sex. That's probably the only thing that can actually be traded in a market. Uh, you know, prostitution is a thing. And like if prostitution were legal, or it doesn't matter whether it's legal or not. Just the question is, prostitution is a level three good. Now, the need here is to satisfy one's sexual craving. Oh, porn is also a level three good. That's a good example. P pornography is level three good because it satisfies one's sexual needs. Again, I put sex up here. So uh, level three goods would include prostitution and porn. Now, uh, in the prostitution case, the object of desire is the sexual, uh, you know, act, you know, coitus itself. And so you can buy that act for money and that satisfies that need, which would make it a level three good. Now, uh, if you desire to not have to go to a prostitute if one's desire is to actually have a sexual partner who is voluntarily what, uh, being your sexual partner, then this good automatically has higher value because the, the object, let me just explain, the, the object of desire in this case is two things. For one, it's the sexual act itself, which you know goes without saying, it's the same in the prostitution case, but it is also, the other person having the desire to have coitus with you. And that is important. The object of desire in this case is two things. It's the act and also the state of mind for the other person, which is in fact an object. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a electrical signals in the brain and, and, uh, you know, their hypothalamus has to be flared up or whatever. It, it, it's something that's very tangibly and very, um, it's something that's very tangible and very physical. So you can call it an object of desire. Uh, now this isn't, uh, just in case anyone gets offended, this isn't any kind of objectification. The whole, like n nothing here, n n nothing here is about ethics yet. That This is me just sort of laying a framework. And what I'm trying to do is quantify things that are typically not quantified. Uh, 
uh, qualitative things like love. You know, but just because these things aren't ever quantified doesn't mean they are unquantifiable. In fact, if you study science, you learn that everything is actually quantifiable. Anyway, so friendship and family. Uh, so, so love here. Uh, let's say love, the emo having someone love you, love and belonging, hell, is a level three good. The object of desire in this case is uh, having a partner, uh, having them perform a service, having them act like they love you, which would entail various acts, um, specifics, probably, it probably involves some kind of sexual intimacy, it probably involves tokens of affection, it probably involves things like hugging it probably involves all sorts of things it really depends on the person it, it it's it, it's very relative but the general behavior of a person like that and above past the behavior you it also another object of desire for love is actually again having it being voluntary just like the sexual intimacy thing having it be something that the person is voluntarily doing that they are in fact uh, that they do in fact love you, that they're neurological, that their uh, brain signals are behaving the same way that they would for someone who is genuinely in love. And you can be absolutely certain that they are genuinely in love. Now you could obviously pay for someone to pretend that they love you, and if they're a good actor, they can keep up the act uh, you know, fairly long, but it, it will eventually be clear that they are doing it, that they are faking their emotions, that they are acting. And uh, someone who is truly in love would not be able to fake their emotions uh, for too long. Even if they're a very good actor, even if they're a sociopath, they would not be able to continually be a faker. So that's how you verify whether you have their real life. That, 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 that is a level three good. So then we have esteem up here, level four. Self-esteem, confidence, achievement, respect of others, respect by others. This includes basically social acceptance by other people and them acting like they respect you. The object of desire is, again, two things. It's people acting like they respect you and it's them actually respecting you in their minds, which again refers to an emotional state of mind uh, within their brains. So there's two objects of desire for the desire to have uh, respect of others or social acceptance. Yeah, so uh, levels four and three are not ever traded in, um, they're, they're not ever actually traded within the market. Now the market, in the market you can buy things like, some people might buy a, a cool car to impress a girl, which might fall as a level three good, so it would be a partial level three good. Some people might buy something expensive to impress others or make other get uh, feel acceptance from other people which would uh, it would be a partial level four good in, in that case so a lot of things a lot of uh, uh, bling tokens would act act as uh, level three and four partial level three and four goods although the vast majority of level three and four is not in the goods themselves that material goods you can buy but it's in people's behavior uh, which is a service, and it's in people's state of minds, which is an untradeable good. And then we come up to self-actualization. Acceptance of facts, lack of prejudice, problem-solving, spontaneity, creativity, and morality. So the virtue of empathy, the virtue of creativity. Oh, uh, one thing I forgot to mention. Uh, empathy is something I would say belongs down here in level three. I think it's a more of a core good than morality. Morality is just sort of an extension of one's level three and four uh, desires. I mean, I, uh, at least that's, at least partially, Any, anyway. But yeah, empathy for other people is definitely something that would probably fall around here, uh, at least for some people, for enough people that it, that it warrants being mentioned, I guess. So the, objects of de uh, the object of desire with that would be seeing other people do well, or in the very least, seeing other people not do poorly. If you do see other people doing poorly, then there is a deficiency within that particular desire. Now, anyway, uh, going back to level five goods. Now, level five goods, Maslow actually said that there's also self-transcendental goods. Uh, so there's also a self-transcendental layer, which is above the self-actualization layer. 
Uh, to me, I'd say at this point, it doesn't really matter. Everything above the first four layers it can be thought of as its own layer. Everything up here, and, and this is basically the else category. This is everything else that doesn't fall down here. So, um, yeah, creativity, spontaneity, you know, morality, uh, acceptance of facts, that's the sort of a truth virtue, problem solving, the desire to solve problems and uh, figure out patterns and learn about the universe. Um, so, interestingly enough, there are level five goods that can be traded. Uh, I would say art falls into this category quite evidently. Not just the creation of art, but the consumption of art. Quite simply put, the reason is because it doesn't fall into any other category, right? It's, it's definitely not something, like of playing a video game, for instance, it's not something you do for self-esteem and respect by others, not necessarily. Uh, it's mostly something you do for yourself. It's, it's self-actualization. -actual, uh, it's something you would do if all of these other things were satisfied, right? I mean, if you were someone who was physiologically okay and safe and you had love and belonging and respect, would you stop doing things? No, you would still consume, you would still play, you 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 might you would still play this video game even if you had all these other layers satisfied. So uh, a playing a video game, consuming a video game or reading a book or watching a movie, consuming art, has to be within the self-actualization uh, layer. It's it's the everything else layer. So uh, creating that stuff is almost definitely up there, but consuming it just as much. So there are, in fact, level five goods that are traded within the... Uh, that are traded by people in the market. But above that, self-actualization or, or self-transcendence is... Um, it, it's something above that. It's not just the consumption of, it's not just the act of consuming art or or prob or consuming science or uh, creating that stuff. It's uh, setting a goal for yourself and being able to complete that goal. You know, you, you, one would have to imagine what would it be like if you had all of this other stuff. What would you be doing? You know, what would you do if you had the esteem, love of your friends, and you were safe, and there was nothing wrong whatsoever? What would you be doing? You would set up goals for yourself, tasks, and you would focus on those goals. And those goals are self-actualizations. Um, they are things that you would not feel good about yourself if you did not have those goals. If you did not satisfy, if if you did not satisfy those goals, you would not feel good about yourself. You would have a a, a level five deficiency. So uh, self-actualization and self-transcendence are an internal thing. They are things that you feel the need is satisfied when you uh, are doing something, uh, doing a specific thing or having accomplished a specific thing or have you have reached a certain yard mark. It is not something that is set merely by uh, creating and consuming things. So so again, the, the, like sleep down here, this is something where the object of desire is your own psychology being in a certain state and your the, the, the your environment being in a certain state where you feel satisfied about having reached your goal. Anyway, those are all of the goods. Levels 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And these are all the goods that are ever desired by human beings. You know, the objects of desire. These are all the things that are ever wanted, desired by human beings. So these are essentially the building blocks for any ethical moral theory. Some of these goods are tradable. Uh, some of these goods are not easy to trade because there's simply no way to sell them. For instance, if you want to appear more sexually uh, available, if you want sexual intimacy with other people and you want to appear more sexually attractive, there are things you can do, but there is no guarantee. Uh, like you could try to dress better, you could try to look more expensive, look better looking, you can try to uh, be more sociable, you could try to be, you could try to seduce, but, but again, there is no surefire way uh, of getting this stuff. Or there's definitely no surefire way of getting a family and friends. Family, like, you're stuck with the family you, you come up with. There's no surefire way of getting these things. These things aren't traded because... For them to be traded, what would happen? 
what would have to be is you would have to have a business that could supply you not only with people who act like they are your family, but feel that they are your family. In other words, it would have to be a business that could program human beings to act like a family members or friends would, which is not something that's technologically feasible in this age. So it's not something that is traded. It's not something that's impossible in the grand scheme of things, but it's not something that's currently possible. So uh, all that said and done, uh, this is basic. That's basically it. The one thing I want to explain is how how to define a loss or gain of a certain good. Now, uh, I haven't defined ownership. That is a key thing here. I haven't defined ownership, and the reason I haven't defined ownership is because it's a problematic concept. Uh, defining ownership, no matter how you try to define it, it boils down to you have to be able to define free will in order to be able to define ownership. And uh, defining free will is not something that's doable. Free will doesn't exist, and I've made videos about why it doesn't exist. And given that our standard right now for defining things is the scientific standard, it's the what does what is reality like standard we're, we're just looking at what real life looks like when defining things uh, free will doesn't exist w within that standard it, it doesn't exist within physics or or science or psychology or anything everything there is deterministic so uh the free will that is required for ownership to make sense as a concept doesn't exist so I'm not, I'm trying, I'm purposefully trying not to define ownership and not to define an exchange of goods because an exchange of goods implies, an exchange of good is predicated on the definition of ownership. But I can still define a loss or gain because what I can do is I can define a uh, deficiency of a, of, a, of a Maslow good and an abundance of a Maslow good. I can also define an overabundance of a Maslow good. Uh, Basically, you know, uh, for breathing, a deficiency would be if the subject can't breathe, if they are lacking air, or for some reason they air cannot enter their lungs, they, they cannot breathe. Food, a deficiency of food is they are hungry, water, they are thirsty, friendless, they have no friends, family, they have no family, sexual intimacy, nobody wants to have sex or coitus with them. They don't have self-esteem. They don't. They 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 have no self-actualization uh, goals. But they have no goals up here. Uh, they they have no safety. These are th these are deficiencies. It's obvious how to define this. It's it's just when the subject feels they have a deficiency, then they have a deficiency. Well, actually, no. It's that's not even true, uh, because the subject could actually. <laughs> that the subject could actually think it has a deficiency when it doesn't. This is more objective than that, but it, it does refer to uh, whether there is a deficiency of a good or not for the subject does refer to a state of psychological state of being that the subject has or a physiological state of being that the subject has, which is something that is verifiable through experimentation. You can do run an experiment to figure out if someone is hungry and you can run an experiment to figure out if someone is lacking in sexual intimacy or anything. Anything on this list can be verified by experiment. So that would be a deficiency. And abundance is the opposite. It's when they have enough. It's when they have, it's when their desire is met. So they have sexual intimacy that they desire. They have the employment resources that they desire. They have enough food, they have enough creativity, etc. There's also such thing as an overabundance for um, level one and two goods for sure. There is uh, probably overabundance for level four, three and four. Haven't thought about it. There is no overabundance of level five goods, but that's something I haven't really proven and I'm not going to. That's just, that's that that's a different subject, but I don't believe that there is such thing as an overabundance of level five goods. Uh, the the difference here is that human beings have finite desires for level one to three level one to four goods, but infinite desires when it comes to stuff that uh, that's up here. Uh, human desire, like like in economics, they introduce this concept of scarcity where uh, hu they say human desires are infinite, but uh, resources are finite. Well, 
human desires are not infinite down here. It, I mean, very few people have, like, it's not reasonable to have infinite desires down here, but they are definitely infinite up here. Uh, just, like, thinking about it, creativity and problem solving, like, these are things that you, if everything else was satisfied, these are things that you would spend your whole life doing. So, yeah, these things are definitely infinite. We're not getting into that, though. Uh, returning back to the subject, you can define an overabundance for these desires because there is such thing as th these desires are finite. And uh, if you have too much of the object of desire, it creates problems on other levels. For instance, if you have too much sexual intimacy with people, it could cause physiological problems. Or if you have too much food, it could cause other physiological problems elsewhere in the list. It, you know, if you have too much food, sorry, if you have too much water, it can create problems with your breathing. If you have too much food, it could create problems with your breathing. If you have too much sleep, it create create problems with your food and water intake. If you have, uh. Uh, if you don't excrete at all, it could create, you get the idea. So, yeah. So, oh, right. Loss and gain. So because an abundance, overabundance, and deficiency of a given object of desire, of a given Maslow good, is clearly defined, you can define a loss or gain by just looking at whether or not... Uh, the, there's an increase in deficiency is a loss, a increase in abundance is a gain. Um, if it's an overabundance, then because of how overabundance is defined, it's when you have enough of one good that it starts to create problems for other things in the pyramid, for other desires in the pyramid, then for instance, if you have, if you drink, if you're drowning, you have so much water that you can't breathe, then that is... Uh, that would be such such thing as a as a deficiency in breathing. That's what you would think of that as a as an increase in breathing deficiency. So it would be a loss of breathing, even though it's a gain of water. It's a gain of water, but it's too much of a loss in breathing. So it's it's not worth it for that person to have that much water. Um, if if you have so much sexual intimacy that you damage. Uh, something in your reproductive system then then that is you damage then then that is also a a uh, that is a gain in level three goods but that is a tremendous loss in level one goods so again not worth it and the with the water thing again it, it's not worth it if you can't breathe that that's usually the thing and breathing again breathing is lower in amongst like level one goods are actually very varied. You can have like food. Food is much less important than water. You need water more than you need food. You need breathing more than you need uh, water. So breathing is more of an important level one good than water, which is more of an important level one good than food. And so there are hierarchies within the hierarchy, which is what I said earlier. So you can define losses and gains. Oh, and okay. So so because of how empathy works. And how empathy is also a resource, a level, uh, a Maslow good. Uh, if I kill someone that you love, uh, that is definitely a loss for them, but it's also a loss for you because it creates a deficiency in friendship or a deficiency in family. You had a friend that you now lost, or a deficiency in morality. You something immoral was done, and so it's a level a level five uh, loss as well. Uh, definitely level three loss and probably level five loss. If you break up with your partner, then that is a level three loss. If you uh, gain a new partner, that's level three gain. If someone steals your partner from you, that's a level three loss. If someone humiliates you, that's a level four loss. If someone kills you, then that's uh, that's a that's that's a loss of everything. Oh, that's one thing I forgot to mention. Uh, life itself isn't on this list, but I feel like it should be because there is an inherent desire to be alive, which is actually what motivates everything else on this list. Or in the very least, it motivates the bottom of the list. It motivates level one, physiological. Uh, in fact, life isn't even a level one good. It, it's more level one desire it's a level zero desire it's more of a meta uh, desire uh, meta need um, sort of 
more so than anything else. So I would consider life to be a level zero. A le I would consider it to be a, a level zero thing. So if, if someone kills your child, then your child has a, a deficiency in everything, but a deficiency in life, which just means a deficiency in everything. So to them, it's an ultimate loss. For you, it's a level three loss. Um, and a level five loss if you care about people getting killed uh, to the killer it if the reason they do it depends but if they did it up by accident then to them it's also level five loss and a level three loss possibly well not not necessarily but if they have empathy for random people then it's level three loss for them too if they do it on purpose because they hate your child then to them it's a gain because it, it could make it, it could be a level five gain for them actually if they do it with good reason. So that is essentially everything I wanted to introduce. Uh, losses, gains in Maslow goods, losses, gains in Maslow resources. And with this, you have everything you need to actually start constructing a moral framework. All you need to do at this point is to say what gains, losses are morally good and what gains, losses are morally bad. And just, just set up a arbitrary standard and that's what morality uh, ends up being. That that's what your morality will end up being. Now, the reason I even introduced this at all is because I'm going to make other videos about utopias, and this is relevant to my videos about utopias. Now, I haven't actually, uh, I don't remember if I said this in these exact words, but the way I define a utopia is a utopia is a world or a state of the world where um, all level one, two, three, and four desires are satisfied for all beings, all consciousnesses within that uh, world. So this includes non-humans, but more importantly for humans, sort of uh, an easy utopia for humans, it would have to be that all humans have all level one, two, three, and four desires satisfied. Not necessarily all level five desires have to be satisfied. In fact, no level five desires can be satisfied, but all level one, two, three, and four desires have to be satisfied because, as we said before, these are all finite needs that can be satisfied with finitely many resources. Um, these cannot. You need infinitely many resources to satisfy self-actualization because there are infinitely many self-actualization desires. Anyhow, that is how I define utopia, and that is how, that is what Maslow goods are. And hopefully you have enjoyed this. And that is it. So stay tuned and cheers.